Hello, and welcome to Houston Moms on the Move. This is a new series by Houston Moms designed to bring you uh, high impact women and moms who are moving in Houston and um, getting things done while raising children or have raised children and hopefully to offer you tips, encouragement, they see you in the trenches, um, and maybe you can grab um, a few bits of inspiration from them as well. Hi, my name is Megan Clanahan. I am the co-owner of Houston Moms. Today, it is my joy to bring to you Deborah Duncan. Um, she is the host of Great Day Houston. Um, you can see them on KHU 11, 9 to 10 a.m. There we go. Um, and she has become someone who I've admired over the past handful of years we've um, interviewed together. But today, we're flipping the script. Ooh. Is <laughs> I'm asking the questions and she is fielding the ball. So um, without further ado, Deborah Duncan, thank you so much for joining us. This you morning. are absolutely welcome. So um, I know a lot of people in Houston have seen you, they watch you, they know who you are, um, but I would love for you to just do um, a quick intro about you and your family um, and your son. All right. Well, I'm one of those moms who had my child later in life. My mom did the same thing. She had me at 40, my brother at 43. And I kept thinking, I'm going to lay all the groundwork. This way I'll, I'll be able to have my career established. I, I'll be able to afford daycare and kind of save money for all this type of stuff. And then you think it's going to make it easier. There are a lot of things that do make it easier. I'm not going to discount that at all. But then uh, there's that moment where it's like, just as a mom, you go, oh my gosh, what did I just do? And <laughs> can I do, can I do that job justice? I remember a friend telling me, you know, she said, it's going to be the, the hardest job you'll ever love. And it is, but there's a lot that goes on between having the baby, as you know, and then this thing emerges trying to have its own personality and everything. Right. Oh. And then you finally get to this. So I am not in the throes of it anymore, but let me let you know, moms, you think that you're like, can I can't wait to get out of this stage right here to some degree. And then you think everything's taken care of. No, they still need you and they still love you more. So I think that's a really important thing. We've kind of talked um, in the past about, you know, th this whole grown and flown kind of thing, but they're really not flown. They still need mom, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I think it's sometimes a little different too when you have, uh, like with my son, he's an only child, right? So he, we are like his best friends, although we have to draw that line all the time. We're getting closer to being friends, but we have to draw that line of being a parent. When I grew up, I was the middle child. So I was kind of left to my own devices. And, and you know, I, I, when I flew the coop, I flew the coop and never looked back. But yeah, he's, he's still here, still in touch and uh, loves his parents very much. <laughs> and he's, not afraid to, he's not afraid to hug me and kiss me in public ultimate boy goals boy yeah. mom goals right like where it's like oh, I just want the like especially for my little Ryan he's in eighth grade now and I'm like and he's still my snuggler and he's, he's you know what they say it's like you know mama's a little boy daddy's a little girl so boys get their sense of self-esteem from their moms girls get it from their dad so there's just kind of a little bit different dynamic oftentimes between uh kids who are male and female and mom and dad there is um oh gosh but if the day he stops hugging, he won't ever. No. We're just going to say it right here. No, right? I said, if you meet a wife one day, you explain to her that you still can hug your mama. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So he's 20 now. Mm -hmm. um, he's kind of starting to carve his own path. But take us back to those early years, because you have been in news media for a long time. Um, this has been something, um, you know, and that's a demanding very demanding profession um, that has, you know, crises like don't have any respect for mom life, right? Yeah, so, you know, because oh. I started with, when I was pregnant with Duncan, I was uh, anchoring the morning news. So I would get ah. up at midnight and, you know, get, get down to work. And so it was a different shift uh, for sure. And you're pregnant on the air. And at the time, they didn't have all the cute clothes they have right now. I, I wore like a, a battleship gray suit, a tan suit, and a brown suit. And I try to mix it up with a <laughs> scarf and everything. Uh, but uh, the other thing I went through before I, I had Duncan is I, I, I had a miscarriage. And it's interesting to me that when it happened, my doctor said, well, yeah, it happens. It happens more often than you probably think. But none of us really realize that when we're you know, getting ready to, to have a baby. In fact, I know you've shared your, your journey as well. 
We think, okay, you grow up, you get married, you whatever, you you get pregnant, you plan a family, and then you think that's the way it's all supposed to happen. Uh, I wasn't uh, ready for that, and I had the miscarriage. So by the time I was pregnant with Duncan, I pretended that I wasn't pregnant. I'm walking around like this, and people are like, is there something going on with Deborah? And I'm like, no, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I just really almost ignored it until I heard him cry. And at that mm -hmm. moment, I lost it. I was like, he's here. Um, so uh, that's how he you know, came into the world. And, and you think you have it down. The best parents in the world, I think, are before you have a child, right? I knew oh, yeah. everything. Those people need to do this with their child. That child needs to be doing this. You need to do that with your baby and the whole bit. Uh, no, you think you have it down. You don't. And that's why I love groups like this, because we can rely on each other for you know advice on how to get through some things. Yeah, and we have talked um, about villages and how important villages are to um, sanity, um, whether they're your village to go out or their village who's picking up your kid from school. Talk a little bit about your village and how they helped you, um, especially during those early years. I mean, before they have a car, like I'm I'm waiting with bated breath. I mean, scared <laughs> to death a little bit. Yeah, because but yeah, that's also, a whole like, different thing, right? You're like, oh, the good, they, I don't have to pick them up anymore, but ooh, they're driving. Ooh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did. I had that village. And, and because I remember if I, in fact, I used to send my son to, to um, a crim de la crim after school because I thought he'd love it. Right. You get there. They have like the swimming pool, the piano room, the dance room, the tennis. They had everything. And then one day he said to me, he goes, Mommy, because I noticed that in the back of the school, other mommies show up in their cars and daddies and they show up in their cars and they pick the kids up. Do you think you could do that? And oh. I was like, I had no idea he wanted to do that. And so I thought about it. That would mean me leaving work uh, a couple of hours before I should really leave work, even a few hours before I should really leave work. And so I worked it out, but I knew uh, I had until 317. At 317 at Bunker Hill Elementary School, I could be the last car to pick him up. Up. So I'd be like, look at my watch and go, gotta go. <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember driving up. It was like slow motion one day. I could see him in a distance and I could see the teacher getting ready to close the gate and lock it because that way they would walk them to the front of the school. So you'd have to enter the other side of the school as the, you know, the walk of shame as the parent who the mommy walk of shame. Yeah. It just didn't get there in time. And I was like beeping my horn. No, I'm here, baby. I'm here. So uh, it was funny, but there were other times when I knew I, I couldn't make it in time. You're right. It was that village. It was like, hey, Gail, Sandra, Lara, what are you doing right now? Can you pick up my child? So uh, we have to rely on that. You know, back in the olden days, that's what it was, was that true village where everyone was, you know, in the village square at the school, the whole bit. And today we're, we're doing so many other things. We need the help and, and we should not feel ashamed that we need that help. Yeah. Um, not a bad mom. <laughs> no. And you know, I depend on my village. Um, in fact, I was texting, I think we talked about this last time. I was texting with my friend Sarah last night. I'm like, we've got to work out this football drop-off thing. Oh, wow. It's like 6.15 in the morning. I'm like, there's no reason we all need to be leaving the neighborhood at 6.15. So like, let's work this out. Um, do you have advice? Because I think what's tough for younger moms is how do you build that village? How do you, do you have any tips, tricks of, yeah. of how you find your people that, um, that you would possibly I, interest with taking your kid? I think you start with um, people who have a like-minded situation or like, you know, they, they understand what you're going through and that's going to start right at school. You know, that's where I, lot, I met a lot of, uh, where my son met a lot of his friends and then I ended up meeting his friend's moms. And so we're all, we were all there for the meetings. We're all there for the luncheons and all that type of thing, but they all have a vested interest. They live in the neighborhood already, so they're not going out of their way. Get to know them, step out and get to know them, get to know your neighbor. But uh, that's that's where I started. And then I had a, a few of my closest friends were here as well. And they kind of, the road that went before me, they had kids you know, way before me so they could kind of help me through. But definitely don't ignore the fact that you're right there in that school where you have some of the best help that understands what you're dealing with. Yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is like authenticity mm -hmm. and just, I think that is one of the things we struggle with, um, kind of where we are at, is, is being like, you know what, this is hard. Like in saying it out loud, like this is a hard journey. And like, I want more people to feel comfortable being like, you know what, maybe I can't do it all. Well, can't do it I all. may be yeah. able to do it all. Maybe not all at the same time. What do you yeah. think about that statement? 
Yeah, no, that's 1000% correct. The, the person who can do it all, please stand up. I want to interview you on the show and figure out how, you, how you're doing that. You can do it all with help, right? And, and back yeah. to the thing of, of, of relying on that other mom uh, to, to pick up your child. The nice thing about that too is my son was in the car with his friend. Right. As opposed to a, in the car with a, a stranger, like he was on the bus before going on to, off to the daycare, which daycares are great. They're, they're, they're awesome. But uh, he was he looked at it as a play date. I looked at it as, OK, good. I got got a ride for you to, a a place to park you until I can pick you up. Yeah. I love that point because I do feel like my son's bond with this other child has grown. They've gone to school together since kindergarten. So I think, you know, they've just kind of existed together but now being in the car together it they have conversations and oh my god okay so that reminds me um is your son obsessed with cologne because mine is um, obsessed with what now you said cologne, cologne. Like spray cologne yeah no no I I in fact it, it, it was a while before I could get him obsessed with deodorant <laughs> you so you are you're miles you're miles ahead of me Megan so here is what has been so interesting about raising a middle school boy is like, yes, I fought for deodorant like in sixth grade. Um, and then they've slowly morphed into like really good deodorant and really good colognes. And they, I mean, like why is that and all of this? No. You know what that means when they're interested in cologne, that's because there's a girl they like. Yeah, that's I'm sorry, Mama. That's a deal. He's like, well, let me just kind of spray it yeah. up a little bit, unbutton the you know top not, a little bit. Oh, we're oh we're not there yet. Oh, we might be there. Um, but it is cute. Like they so the the boys. I, I'm still gonna call them little boys. They chat on the way home and they talk about the new cologne in their drawer. It's a whole thing. Um, people will back me up on this. Um, but is there a memory that you can? kind of recall from his childhood. Um, oh gosh, there there are a few of and them. And it's Duncan's childhood. We didn't even mention that. Yeah, yeah. There And there are a few of them because, uh, you know, we oftentimes go into parenthood thinking we, what we want to do is to raise this child to go out into the world and, and contribute to it. And we're going to teach them all the lessons. I can't tell you how many times he taught me lessons. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember one time I was I was so busy. I was looking, I misplaced my keys and I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, and he goes, mommy. I said, not now, not now, Duncan. I'm looking for my keys. And I, he goes, mommy. I go, not now. I'm looking for my keys and he just sat there for a couple of minutes and finally he said is this what you're looking for right here mommy he goes they were right there on the table I wouldn't pay attention to him I just didn't pay attention to him because I was so involved in what I was doing and then one time I was in the car and everything just started falling apart for the day it, 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 looking back it was not a big deal it's just that things were not happening the way they're supposed to happen yeah. and my son could sense my frustration and he just said what's wrong mommy and I said, well, this happened, this happened, this happened, da, 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 and this is happening. And he goes, oh. And a couple of minutes later, he goes, is anybody going to die? I said, well, no, no one's going to die. He goes, then it's okay. Right? The perspective of a child. And then one other thing I want to share is just how much they observe and how much smarter they are than sometimes we, we think they are. We were driving down the street one day and he saw a homeless man and my son was just staring out the window. I could see him in the rear view mirror. He's in his little car seat. And then he just said, what happened to his piece of earth? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, the man over there, what happened to his piece of earth? He goes, mommy, everybody needs their piece of earth. That's where you sleep. That's where you eat. That's where you think. That's where you go to, you know, do everything in your life to, to go out into the world. And so uh, the man was homeless. And I thought, wow, for him to observe that. And, and my son is one of those kids who has that kind of servant's heart. He, he struggled in school, dyslexic, ADHD, but he wants to be, he's in college now to be a clinical psychologist uh, because he wants to help uh, change policy in terms of how we treat and teach kids with learning differences. We weren't going to cry today. Oh. But that was... <laughs> yeah, but he catches me a lot. He, he Instead of me teaching him, he's the one teaching us a lot. I, what a sweet story. Um, gosh, they are so old souls like that we, you know, I, you know, untethered by kind of the, uh, I guess. The trappings that we fall into. That we yeah. have. 
you know, um, that they, they can see the beauty. Like that reminds me, we were driving through a Sonic parking lot. I mean, not the same, but like we we're going to get mommy's diet Coke. Right. And Ryan rolled down the window and he just was in this big, I love you phase. I don't know. He was like probably two or three and he was just yelling out the window. I love you. I love you. I love you. And the sweetest people turned and they're like, I love you too. I love you too. And I'm like, gosh, if we just all did that. Um, yeah. You know, you started that going through the drive through story and uh, it, uh, I, my, my drive through story went a little differently. We drove through uh, Chick-fil-A and they're like to drink. And my son goes Chardonnay. I go, no, 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 no. They don't do that here. He goes, you always drink Chardonnay. No, 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 no. I, I don't always drink Chardonnay. He's like, she wants a Chardonnay. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yours, your, your child was doing something a little different than mine was doing. <laughs> no, no. Lynn Clanahan can call a girl out. Like at any restaurant when she was like six and up, she, they would come over, take my drink order and be like, and they're like, what do you want to drink? And Quinn's like, she'll have Pinot Grigio. <laughs> I'm like, stop. I, well, yes, but no. Well, like, I also want a glass of water with lemon. And I will have a Diet Coke too. <laughs> it's very important to caffeinate and libate. I don't know. They see it all. Um, I love that your son is, uh, you know, really in wanting to promote the learning differences. Um, we chatted a little bit before that Quinn is dyslexic. Um, and I think it's really cool that they kind of get to own that journey um, and how important it is for him um, to to step up and say, you know, like, hey, this is me. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And you come quite honestly, you know, his dad's dyslexic. I'm ADHD. Uh, I was diagnosed while I was growing up in Taiwan. His dad was in Spain at the time. And, uh, you know, it was looked at a little bit differently. Uh, but uh, for my son, we were able, we kind of saw it coming and we were able to get him diagnosed early. And I'll say to any parent out there that's dealing with it, it is not the end of the world. They just, they, they, they develop different coping skills, but it is not the end of the world. They're bright, um, but also understand that you have to advocate for your child. You have to go sit down in that office. And, you know, every every public school uh, is mandated to follow certain rules. And there's that system called ARD, right? There may be times when your child might need a little more time for a test, for example, or might need uh, for a teacher to read the question, whatever it is that they need to do to adjust so that they can uh, learn and take in the information they're being taught. That is available to you. And sometimes it's harder at some schools than others. We were very blessed at Bunker Hill Elementary School with the vice principal had children who are also dyslexic and ADHD. And she said, listen, let us do this. You don't have to send them to a private school. Private schools can do great work, but we can do it right here where you live. And he'll still be here going to school with the friends in the neighborhood. And 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 they did. They worked it through. And we we, we got through. Today, my son, um, uh, he still has trouble spelling certain things, but go figure. He's taught himself uh, Russian, uh, Mandarin. He's teaching himself Arabic. And I, I kept thinking, I said, Duncan, you just you just know a few Russian words. He goes, no, mom. He goes, I, I kind of know it really well. Go, okay. He would, on Saturdays, he would say, hey, what are you doing this morning, mom? Can you drop me off at the Russian grocery store? I'm like, there's a Russian grocery store? <laughs> he goes, yeah. And he would go speak to people. He would go to the, the consul general's office and say, you know, I want to go talk to them about their election. They're having an election today. So when he walked up and to the guy and spoke to him, he's like, Privet Kodila. The guy goes, Privet Kodila from you? And then... I said, is he really speaking Russian to you or is he just saying some words? And he goes, no, he's very good. He speaks Russian better than we do. <laughs> so it's interesting how your kids will surprise you, but your, your child may develop a little bit later on some things, but they'll develop, they'll get there. You and love the there. child you have, not the one you thought you were going to get or the one that you're comparing to somebody else's child. Who? boom. Um, I'm going to have to remind myself of that. In like that a million one. times. Because I mean, that is, that's the crux of it because we kind of, as you alluded to earlier, we kind of go into this motherhood journey thinking, you know, it looks like marriage and then baby and the carriage and, um, everything comes out smooth and sweet. And then you have your two kids plus, you know, a couple dogs or whatever. Yeah. I mean, whatever your white picket fence dream looked like, it likely looks different, um, yeah. today. And, um, what I hear from you is a lot of, um, passion that you poured into your children. Um, how, 
how did how did that I mean how did you do that like how did you have the energy to keep doing that because you know especially if you have a kid who is is maybe a little bit I mean we're not going to say more challenging but there are challenges. He was more you know, he was more challenging for sure and I think sometimes he knew it sometimes he would look at us and he'd be like okay I'm just gonna and, and I actually appreciate a little bit of that because I see the personality that he has to get things done. Uh, when he says, I want to change policy in the way that we teach and treat children with special needs, it's going to take that uh, to, mm -hmm. to change that policy, right? But you say, how did I do it? I didn't do it alone. Uh, Duncan's dad was right there with me. He may not have known what to do when I needed it done, but if I told him, it got done. I'd just be like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm doing this, I'm doing that and doing that. And I would I'd do this whole list of all the things I'm doing. His doctor's appointment is closed, his school is homework. And so Neil just looked at me one day and goes, just tell me what to do and I will do it. It will be done. You just gotta tell me what to do. <laughs> Right. And sometimes we think by trying to be that mom, that term mom, there's a dad, too. And, you know, if there's not a dad in the house, you find that male figure who can be, you know, somewhat of a, of a, of a, a father like figure to, to that child. But a lot of households, I know women are married. They have they have a husband in the house. They have a dad in the house, but they don't give him credit for being able to do anything. And I, I always start with just ask. Well, I don't know if he can do it like I can do it. Well, he might not be able to do it like you can do it. He may be able to do it better. Just ask. Mm. That is, so that goes back to like kind of the mental load that I feel like we all carry, whether it's, and I don't think we mean to be martyrs, um, but sometimes we can turn ourselves into that. And yeah. you're so right. That ask, God, we have to ask for help. Like I did not ask for help when the twins were like, NICU, not home. I mean, I just didn't. And and then I got mad because I'm like, why is no one helping me? Well, yeah, and you're exactly right. That's what happens is that if you bottle it all in and you don't get that help, you get mad. It's interesting. The Surgeon General just came out with a report, you know, yesterday where he said, um, uh, parents in this country are under great stress, is like you think. Um, and that stress comes out sideways oftentimes. And we and we see that where kids can either be ignored. In some cases, you know, kids are neglected, they're abused. And so we have to address that and we have to change some things in this country, like helping with, with uh, you know, daycare, helping with when the child gets to school and after they get out of school, the help that they can get. And there are lots of programs out there, people know about them, but you just, you have to do your research. Unfortunately, you just, you have to, you have to sit down and do your research. Uh, I know the Salvation Army runs the Boys and Girls Clubs in the Houston area, and that's such a saving grace for so many parents who may still be at work where the child after school can get help with homework, they can get a snack, they can get a mentor, you know, someone to talk to. So look for those programs. They do exist. Yes. And I think that is the beauty of social media. There's a lot of negativity on social media where you're like tempted to not be on social media but there's so many resources if you ask any like mom's group around town like I do I live in Katy so I'm on Katy mom's group and I'll be like hey what are y'all doing for this and like hive minds are always a really good place um <laughs> they and it helps and you can find those resources and yeah. so I think and, that's and, a and be okay with who you are and what you're doing. I remember the first time I showed up, it was like a, a first grade uh, luncheon and we went to one of the houses and, you know, I'm taking off from work and I'm trying to get there in time. And as I'm turning the corner, I wait for this one woman. She's, she's in a, a, on a bicycle and had the basket. It was very iconic, right? It had the basket and, she, and I could see swash, like swishing back and forth her fresh squeezed lemonade that she was bringing. So everyone in the room for the most part had baked something, squeezed something, made something like, oh, thank you. You. it's my grandmother's recipe and it's just we've passed it down for years and you know I, meanwhile I swung by the grocery store but I was sitting in the corner with the two other women who worked outside the home because I'm gonna tell you when I stayed home for a while that is tough right but mm. these two other women I'm like well, what do you do she goes I, I'm a lawyer I'm, a, I'm in the DA's office I'm a prosecutor the other one what do you do she goes um, I'm a doctor down at Texas Children's um, and I won't even take care of my own kids medically. I have to refer them out to somebody else because I'm a basket case when I'm dealing with my own kids. But it was funny because we felt guilty that all three of us went to the grocery store. Don't feel guilty. The fact that you're there and you're in the room and don't compare yourself because the funny thing was I had a couple of women who were stay-at-home moms who said, you know, I really wish I, I could have, you know, I, I, I majored in journalism and, or communications. I wish I was doing what you're doing. I'm like, but you got three kids. 
anyone could understand that, right? Because uh, yeah. there's so much to keep up with. So it, it's like, don't lament any of that. You are where you are. You made the choice that you made and, and they're all valid. Oh, such important words. Um, I think there's like a meme that goes around that. Like, I'm the first to volunteer to bring the cups and the napkins. Like, yeah. I'm the I first do- to call you and say, um, what do I owe you? <laughs> Yeah, I'll throw the like, money. I'm gonna um, throw the money at what's it. your Venmo? Um, because yeah. I can take care of that real quick. And I work from home. And so I don't know. I mean, we all have different giftings, we all have different skills, we've all made different life decisions. It's important to affirm all of this. Yeah. Um, we're all doing the best we can, right? Yeah. Um, so we're gonna take a hard pivot because I'm gonna be respectful of your time. Um, we're gonna do a rapid fire. Okay. It's gonna be like real quick. Um, see how quickly you can come up with them. Um, Deborah Duncan, rapid fire for Houston moms. Um, favorite restaurant in Houston? Um, home. No, a, a, a quick story. Okay, you, you said rapid fire. I, I okay. I, I have to give this quick story. We were looking, works I know, I'm ruining perfect. it. I'm ruining the whole thing. But uh, we would always go. Okay, where do we go eat tonight? Where are we gonna go eat tonight? Um, 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 um. And my son goes, let's go to that place. You know, it has all that food. I go, what? All the restaurants have all that food. He goes, you know that place? He goes, it, it's like they have tasters and everything. He goes, I love that place. I love that restaurant. But what restaurant are you talking about? He was talking about the grocery store. <laughs> so we have a joke when you say favorite restaurant. We have a joke. It's the grocery store. It's the grocery store with the free samples. So it must be like H-E-B or a Costco or something. <laughs> um, so, well, that kind of leads into the next one. So, okay. But now your son is 20. What's your favorite restaurant to go to him? Go with him. Yeah, he he loves going to Carabas because that's home for him. I always joke with um with Johnny Carab and his mom. I always say uh, Duncan is, is made of Carabas, especially the Carabas bread. Okay. Um, so the original one, because there's a couple of different. Yeah. Voss and Woodway. Yep. Uh, right. Yeah. Voss and Woodway is one. And the one on Kirby, I went to both of them. There you go. So okay. When I was pregnant, I was, I would eat the rolls all the time. So literally my son is made of Carabas. Mine's made of pot belly. I couldn't get enough of the sandwiches. They were just pop. I, I, I don't know what it was, but, um, it took me about 10 years to start eating it again. Cause I ate it so much. Um, Favorite place to take your kid in Houston. Now this could be back when he was like teen or younger or current. Yeah. You know, uh, any place that had a green space when he was little. So that was Ciro's and city center. They had that green space or loopy tortilla on highway six, because you could let kids just have at it. And it's funny in America. Sometimes I think we think kids are an interruption in life, but having spent time overseas, kids are a part of life. If they're at the restaurant running around and yelling and screaming, they're like, yeah, let them run. Right. But here it's like, oh my gosh, somebody should take, take that child and make them sit down. So I love the green spaces. Yes. Um, so many great green spaces around town now though, too. Like we have city center, we have a handful out in Katy. Yeah, Discovery We're, Green. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everywhere. Just, yeah. All of those, um, let them get the wiggles out. They don't want to like chat with you about their day anymore anyway. Yeah. Right. Let them be kids. Um, okay. So take us to your favorite thing to do when you don't have mom or job responsibilities? What does Deborah Duncan do um, with a few hours off? I love to spend time with friends, but now I also love to spend time with my son in a different way. And so, like I mentioned earlier, so this is where he started, or where he started having his own opinions and stuff. And now it's like, he's here, right? <laughs> the 20 year old. Um, I, I love, because I'm out so much and I do a lot of charity work and things, I love spending time within my four walls and with him. We find movies to watch together and uh, I learn from him about what he, you know, his, his likes, his hopes, his dreams, all that stuff. We have intense conversations. Uh, it's like I'm, it's like we have a date for just all of us to talk, his dad and I and him to talk. Beautiful. I love it. I look forward to that. Um, and I can see it starting to progress to mm-hmm. that, like um, where we're like talking about serious things and then. Somebody will throw out a, bro, did you make my lunch? (laughs) Okay, so we're not quite there yet. Um, Okay, last one. Um, Favorite thing about being a mom? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a a big one. Um, 
the greatest, the greatest joy, even in some of the tougher times, um, but just the greatest joy of hoping that I have been able to produce a human being who literally will go out into the world and make a difference. Yep. <laughs> that part. Yeah, that part. Yeah. You know, it just, it's, it's, you know, so many times we, we see them as a, um, an extension of us. Yeah. I, I initially wanted to be the extension of me, but then I want to cut that cord and say, but you're, it's all you yeah. now it's all you. Yeah. And, and go forth, do great things. Um, and I'm sure he will, because he has had a tremendous, um, provider and supporter, um, ringleader for him. Um, I have no doubts um, mm -hmm. for Duncan. Um, I'm so grateful that you shared with us today all of these stories. Like this has been so much fun for me because we're usually just talking like events. It's been happening. Yeah, but but thank you for bringing those events to us because as you know, when you're a mom and you're trying to entertain those kids, you are looking for everything and, and a lot of those things on a dime to do that. So thank you for doing that for us. But I, and I also have to say, it it is so hard for me to be on this other side like this. So whew, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> Well, ditto. Uh, I'm working on it. Um, I prefaced y'all, the audience, I, I prefaced um, Deborah that I'm like, you know, I didn't like go to, like, I'm not a professional. Like nobody could guess, right? Um, well, I'm not a professional answerer. I'm a, I'm a professional questioner. <laughs> Well, yes, and you do such an amazing job. It's always a joy to be over at your team. Um, Great day, Houston. I know that is a huge um, baby of yours too. Um, and your team is incredible. Um, every time I go, I feel so loved. And that is a direct influence of um, the past. we got young parents on, on the team too, you know, um, and young dads. And it's interesting because I, I, I see these young dads, they're different than the stereotype of the dads that we may have grown up with uh, a generation or two before. They are so involved, so sleeves rolled up. And so it, when we talk about, you know, equality in, in a relationship in that sense uh that whole generation has i think a lot of them risen to the occasion for sure it has been and i know exactly who you're talking about and it is so fun to see them i mean just down there like getting it done and um taking videos asking their kids questions interviewing them like using their skills and um it is such a joy and we do need to recognize um the dads who are who are doing that um, because yeah, it's, it's different than the ones who would just kind of um, maybe previous to my generation, just kind of show up at soccer games and be like, Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like a bourbon in my, you know, drink, but it's fine. <laughs> like we show what's up. In your, your, that should be your next, your next, one of your rapid fire questions for the next person, not for me. What's in your Yeti at, at the game? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. When you're walking around the neighborhood with your Yeti, you're not, no, it's yeah. not water. You're not hydrating. Uh, you are a delight. I loved seeing you. Thank you for taking the time. Um, just again, so, so much fun. Um, I want to remind um, all my people watching, this is a series that's going to continue. We are profiling these high impact moms and women around um, Houston and um, again, providing some um, levity and showing how we are all kind of the same. We're all just trying to get through this, um, but hoping that you're going to pull out some little nuggets of wisdom and something that will make your day go a little bit better um, and something to think about for your week ahead. So we're thankful for the time. We'll be back next month with another high impact um, woman. Deborah, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you.